Welcome to the Secrets of College Planning. I'm your host, Anthony Uva, and today we're going to get some insight into supply chain after college. My guest today is Stuart Rosenberg, and he is the professor of supply chain, and welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah, so uh, usually I start my guests uh, where they went to college. So where'd you go to school? <coughs> uh, I went to uh, Sydney University of New York, and in, in specifically Brooklyn College. Ah. There's sort of a number of... Uh, of colleges underneath that underneath that heading that okay. makes to comprise uh, City University of New York. All right, so mm -hmm. you went to the City University of New York. Um, let's just go back in time. Uh, let's go into high school. And uh, when did you start thinking about going to college? Was it the freshman year, senior year? When mm -hmm. when did it all begin for you? I think pretty much in this, uh, sophomore year of high school. I um, first I was thinking about going into a vacation, uh, electrical, plumbing, and whatnot, <coughs> but, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> uh, I decided against that. Uh, I wanted to go into uh, something more cerebral okay. and more, more of a thinking man's um, career. So I went towards, uh, decided to go to the academic, academic. Uh, now, was path. it was it more than just one college that you were deciding on, or was it that the it, just because the college was in New York and you're from New York, uh, that's why you went? Well, <coughs> when I went to college, not, um, a lot of my friends really, we really didn't go away to college like a lot of the college aides kids go today. We stayed pretty much close to home. I mean, I had friends that went to Baruch and City, and City College way up in Manhattan, but that was about the furthest they went to venture. Really. We were close-knit. <laughs> <laughs> so, you go to college. Um, what's City College like? Well, Brooklyn College was unique. <laughs> it was a beautiful campus in the midst of Brooklyn. People don't realize it. Um, <clears throat> It had a common area, and it was <coughs> this beautiful grassy area. We used to play football on there and frisbee and, and everything during classes. Uh, during classes, I'm sorry. During college, during class breaks, slip of the tongue there. <laughs> I didn't mean to say that we cut classes. <laughs> um, the parents will hit watch this and say what? <laughs> sure. <laughs> but uh, it was beautiful, almost bucolic. Um, uh, setting in the midst of uh, um, uh, Brooklyn, which is a very large populated uh, borough, and it had a, you know downtown Brooklyn where the shopping was and, and in residential areas. But <laughs> grew up there. It was a very nice place to grow up. There were a lot of parks, and um, believe it or not, went to Coney Island, the beach, and the, and the amusement parks, and sure. uh, and other places. So now you graduate <coughs> from college. How does one go from graduating from college to becoming a professor of supply chain, of all? Well, that's a long story, <laughs> and uh, it's an interesting one. When I, when I graduated Brooklyn College, um, I graduated with an accounting degree, a BS in accounting, and I started off as a financial accountant. <laughs> And I really, really decided after about a year, this wasn't for me. I couldn't see myself sitting behind a desk and just, you know, back in those days, I'm aging myself a little bit. We had the eight column spreadsheets. Sure. <laughs> <We're no comp> <laughs> uh, so I couldn't see myself doing that all, all day for eight hours a day. <clears throat> I was, I had to be active. I had to be walking around and observing and see what was going on. So, <clears throat> Unknown to me at the time, but through an uh, accounting society that I belonged to, a gentleman told me about a, uh, a different path. And they, at that time, it was called management accounting. It was a precursor to supply chain, really, <coughs> um, where you're in manufacturing. And at the time, Jersey had a lot of manufacturing companies in, in, in Jersey uh, before things started to change. And you would be basically... Uh, talking to the people on the floor, working the machinery, observing what was going on, <coughs> um, having, excuse me, doing reports at the end of the day, but basically those reports are what you observed about how the process went and where it could be improved <coughs> or where it needed to be changed or not improved. Mm -hmm. You know, as I say, if it's not broken, don't fix it. 
and uh, I enjoyed that because I was on I was on the manufacturing floor for maybe seven hours and in my desk for one cranking out so that's what I decided to do so I went went in that direction and uh, changed changed companies okay because I was in an accounting firm small accounting firm at the time and I went into a <coughs> manufacturing company and <coughs> decided instead of a CPA, which is Certified Public Accountant, to go to for a CMA, which is what they call uh, Certified Managerial Accountant uh, certification. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so that was my path. And one thing led to another. And uh, CMA somehow evolved into supply chain over the years and manufacturing overseas. <laughs> and therefore, um, <coughs> Not everything was right in front of you. You had to, uh, you couldn't observe on the working floor. You had to actually take trips to the manufacturer plant. You had to get reports and, and, and study them <laughs> and s s watch the quality. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then when you moved everything overseas, you actually moved your inventory and your warehousing overseas as well and built it again in the same building where your manufacturing was going on, just in a different section. Okay. So that progressed into, and then <coughs> the supply chain and also the transportation end of it, because you had to bring it back to America once uh, the finished goods. <coughs> To, to not just to America, but other markets that opened up. Europe, Asia, uh, Trans-Pacific, uh, which came later, um, Australia, Canada, Mexico, whole world opened up. So how, how did you become a professor in it? That happened, <coughs> again, almost by accident. Uh, unfortunately, I was downsized um, um, through a company. <coughs> and they had sold off the division I was working in. So I was downsized, and along with many other people. And I decided, well, I need a different path. And this was about, also about two, uh, 2008, 2009, and when everything crashed and we almost had another depression. <laughs> and I decided to take a needed to go in a different path. So uh, I was going to networking groups uh, all over New Jersey, in particular PSG, in which is in the uh, professional service group, which is in, holds its meaning the Princeton Public Library. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and I met a few people there, talk, spoke, and that's like networking, met them for coffee, lunch, and whatnot. <coughs> and they told me, well, they suggested that I try this different path that, um, you know so much about supply chain, you've had all this experience, why not try teaching it to the up and coming uh, students, in even, even in high school, yeah. uh, and not, let alone in college. I decided I don't want high school students, because I remember myself being a high school student. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to go that route. So I decided in college. <laughs> And I decided, you know, um, advice was to start small. So, not try for a, a four-year school. Start in community colleges, and see what their needs are. So mm -hmm. I contacted a few um, community colleges: uh, Hudson County, uh, Union County College, Brookdale, even Middlesex County, Mercer County, right here in the neighborhood. <coughs> and um, only two of them. Um, came back and said, well, we, we, we have a, a supply chain program that we'd like to <coughs> actually enact and implement. <coughs> and those two were Hudson County Community in Jersey City and Brookdale Community College in Lincroft. And uh, so went down, had an interview, and all things went well. And, and we started the program. At, at both colleges. So, so what happens when a student takes the program? What, what is part of the program? How does it work? Okay, the program again <laughs> is broken down. Supply chain is broken down into seven disciplines. Um, inventory management, warehousing, logistics, 
transportation, which can be combined, depends on how you teach it, customer service, <coughs> demand planning and forecasting. Oh, that's seven of them. Okay, I'm sorry. Transportation, <laughs> depends on how you teach transportation logistics. It could be separate. Yep. Okay. Uh, and <coughs> so for each one that you teach, uh, you can get a certification. Uh, the colleges run the, run the program in conjunction with <coughs> the Council of Supply Chain Management Professionals, which is the supply chain <coughs> um, a slash accounting organization, much like this um, CPA, much like AICPA, which sponsors the CPA exam, they sponsor the certification exams okay. for, each, for each discipline. So the students would go through each course and at the end of each course, they would take the certification exam uh, and hopefully pass it. And, and once you get the seven disciplines, where, where, do you, uh, where do you end up working? Well, you can work, basically you work in supply chain in that field, hopefully. <laughs> um, the issue is with um, New Jersey, the large manufacturing companies by and large left New Jersey, so basically a lot of that's left is logistics companies and service companies. Mm -hmm. So that's, we, we gear them towards that because it's understandable that's basically um, the large group that's left in New Jersey is mostly uh, logistics or fulfillment centers. Where are some of the manufacturing companies that students can go to if, if that's the field that they're looking into? <laughs> well, what's some of the states that, that have manufacturing? Well, um, I know a lot of a lot of a lot of the companies that left New Jersey have gone to to the southern part of the state. I mean, the southern part of the United States, Midwest, what they used to call the Rust Belt, is, is staging a comeback. <coughs> um, but not the um, the larger manufacturing firms, not the Unilevers, not the Nestle's, not the Hershey's, et cetera, et cetera, who still manufacture. A lot of those companies are still manufacturing overseas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's the small to mid-sized manufacturers that have um, revitalized themselves in, now, in those areas. Now, some of the students uh, that graduate and go into that type of field, do they, um, do they go into a, like a management track? Is it something where they grow within <coughs> the company and, and move, move within the company? That's the plan. That's the plan. Um, <coughs> so many, some of my students are, have been in supply chain in, in other companies, but they're unfortunately unemployed right now. They've been downsized or outsourced is the terms uh, overseas or, or um, downsized through mergers and acquisitions which is still ongoing, or, so, or some of them, of course, are just looking for a career change. They've been in other fields and unfortunately have experienced the same thing, downsizing and outsourcing. <coughs> so they're looking for an opportunity to diverse and go into a career change. So is the field uh, more on a downsize or an upside? No, it's on an upswing, I would say. <coughs> um, my class sizes have increased um, because <coughs> due to the fact that there some colleges want to make it from a certification program into a baccalaureate program, so that's attracting some students. And also the fact that um, many companies, we've partnered with many companies to come into the schools and meet with the students <coughs> and explain to them their, their business and <coughs> take their resumes and <coughs> hopefully uh, once they reach the, the final certification um, can join that particular company. So what are, what are two or three type of positions that a, that a student can get uh, once they get these certifications? Well, as I said, they can choose what it, seven disciplines. They can go into either one of the seven disciplines. So if you're going into inventory management, for argument's sake, <laughs> um, you can become an inventory analyst, uh, 
an inventory supervisor on an inventory supervisor since a lot of companies run multiple shifts let's say two or three shifts you can be an inventory supervisor on any of those shifts hmm. and then you report to let's say the inventory manager who controls all three or all two shifts so you can break, break you can be broken down the same thing with an inventory analyst it can be broken down and you can be working on one or two shifts. So do you recommend mm -hmm. that a student has mm -hmm. a background in uh, accounting or something like your field that you had? You don't necessarily need to be an accountant to be in supply chain. It, it doesn't hurt to be <laughs> able to, to, be able to um, work on a spreadsheet yeah. and, and do um, a sell spreadsheet and do all that's needed to be done, pivot tables and all that, and lookups and, and VLOOKs. I don't want to get too technical with that. But it doesn't hurt because a lot of companies are looking um, for the technology to help them with the supply chain. Now, is it is it going digital like everything else? Yes, that was a good question. I was about to get into that. I teach one of the part of the, one of the part of the um, disciplines is not a discipline unto itself, but it's interconnected with all the other seven, is um, the digital age. Uh, <coughs> I give them a little taste of artificial intelligence, machine learning, 3D printing, uh, Internet of Things, and show them how, those, there's more than those four, but I'm just naming those four, how each one is, in, you can integrate each one into whatever discipline in the supply chain you want to um, expertise in yeah. and use it. And companies are looking for that. They're looking for technology, technological advanced students um, to help them reach that goal, reach the digital age. Now, you mm. also brought a book here. Mm -hmm. uh, so did you write the book? And can yes. you give us the title and what sure. it's about? Yes, I wrote the book. So my first book. <coughs> it was published last year. <coughs> uh, it's called A Global Supply Chain and Risk Management. Going back <coughs> a little bit, when I said manufacturing has gone, started to go overseas and it's continuing to go overseas, <coughs> there is a risk to that, a great risk to that. <coughs> um, there is a risk in the transportation of overseas. There's a risk to that in um, quality control and the risk of that in not, being able, not seeing being able to see your inventory. You have to trust other people that are on site to give you the right information. Sure. <laughs> and that could be very disconcerting for, for some people. Uh, and for me in particular, because I'm a visual person many times. I have to see my inventory. <laughs> so now the book doesn't seem too big. Uh, no. it's, it's a good read. Mm -hmm. um, Give us some detail of, uh, of the book and what it's, a, what it's about. It's a series of articles <coughs> broken down by um, parts. There's four parts. Okay. Um, what are the four parts? Parts are um, procurement, inventory management, warehousing, and then the last part is uh, continuous improvement, uh, meaning Lean and Six Sigma and, uh, and other other continuous improvements like that to aid and help um, improve the supply chain. Now, do most and people get into the Six Sigma type of thing? What, what is Six Sigma for, for people that don't know? Lean, lean and Six Sigma, they're tied together, but they're two, basically two separate um, entities, two methodologies, not entities, they're methodologies. Lean, they both were, were created by the Japanese. In a short history, um, <clears throat> after World War II, Japan was devastated, especially after Hiroshima, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Their industries were obliterated, and they um, decided, of course, with our help, we need to rebuild. Sure. <laughs> so they came up with this um, methodology called Lean, and it's to run your business as lean as possible, but it's not what, what has become of it, and some people think of it as a 
running away with fewest people, many, fewest people as possible. That's not what lean is. Lean is basically um, to discover waste within your company. And how do they discover it? <laughs> well, through being on the manufacturing floor all day long, observing the process, and, and, and talking to their employees who are actually doing the process to ask them, what can we do to improve it? So do you see more uh, machinery coming in and, and taking over a lot of that because it, it's more efficient? Well, yes, a lot of companies are going to machinery and robotics. I mean, even Amazon, uh, is, or is moving in robots <laughs> to, and, ro and ma Amazon's not a manufacturer, it's a fulfillment center, mm -hmm. <laughs> but they're bringing in robots as well in certain parts of the building, not in, not, they're not replacing everybody yet, but in certain parts of the building where the inventory is kept in the warehouse, they're bringing in <laughs> what they call Kiva robots, where the uh, people who are picking the products out of the warehouse Mm -hmm. are uh, standing still, they're stationary, and the robots are bringing the, um, <coughs> the storage bins or the, uh, or the uh, storage bins to the, to the pickers, and then the robots are taking them back, back where they came from. Interesting. So, 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 um, what other fields mm -hmm. are there? So, you said service fields as yeah. well. Uh, what do they do in the service field? How, how does how does uh, supply chain work in the service field? Well, so, so when I say service field, I I mean uh, IT, or they used to be called IT, and now it's technological. <laughs> um, basically, the role of of the C, even the C-level people are changing. The, uh, the CFO would never get, or the controller would never get involved in techno tech, uh, technology. Now they have to because they have to, the technology has changed so much. Mm -hmm. uh, it has to be fully integrated. You have to make sure you, whatever technology system you're using and they call it ERP system, Enterprise Resource Planning Systems, which encompass every department within the supply chain. Hmm. All those seven disciplines are on that system and f fully integrated with each other. So if I'm in demand planning, somebody in demand planning can see what procurement's doing and vice versa and work together to have a smooth operation. And even there's a dotted line out to other people, what we call dotted line not directly in the supply chain, like human resources and finance. Okay? So they can also see, well, procurement's bringing in all these raw materials. Well, guess what? Finance has to <laughs> write the checks. <laughs> yeah, sure. So I have to have notice ahead of time that to prepare. So it intertwines with basically every department in, in, the, in the chain, basically yes. why it's called supply chain. Yes. Okay, so, so yes, exactly. is, is all, all the students, they're, they're learning all of these seven disciplines? Mm, yes. Okay, so can, can they learn only one or two and still then go get a job, or is it that they have to get all seven disciplines? Well, the way that the, the program is set up with the help of uh, in conjunction with the with that Council of Supply Chain Management Professionals, is that they have to complete the program of all seven um, disciplines, including the digital and the, the digital learning process. Okay. Okay. And then they can, <laughs> once they get all certifications, they get a master certification that'll just say um, supply chain certification initials and signed by actually signed by the president of that uh, organization. Wow. So they can put that on their resume, present it to companies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Good. Well, we're coming to the end of our show. Okay. And uh, wow. usually mm -hmm. I, I ask my guests, um, <laughs> what advice do you want to give to the parents, their sons mm -hmm. and daughters that are interested in going into a field like this? What advice do you want to give to them? Find a mentor. Find a mentor. Find somebody that you trust implicitly and explicitly. Explain to them your situation. I, I did that, and to this day, 
He's a, he's a close friend of mine. He's become a close friend of mine. And he will never take credit for what he, he has done for me, how he has helped me in the advice, and the advice he's given me and the time he spent with me. I, uh, I was on the, he was on the phone with me for, um, for three hours, I believe it or not. And I have like, at the beginning when I decided to change over, and I have five pages of notes for him. And he would never let me we pay him in any way. It was just this way. So that's my. If you, this your career change or you're going from senior in college to freshman, in, in, I mean senior in high school and a freshman in the college, find a mentor. It could be a professor. It could be um, a, a person in a company that you may happen to know. Uh, or it could be a family member. Whatever it is, but find your mentor. And another bit of that is when I said it could be in a, uh, uh, somebody in a company, even though you're not working yet, even though you're still in, in school, go to networking groups. As I mentioned before, there's so many in New Jersey. There's a PSNG, PSCG. Uh, there's one in, up further north in, in Short Hills. Um, there's a number of them that you can find. Well, good. Thank you very much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Yeah. So you've been watching The Secrets of College Planning. I'm your host, Anthony Uva. Until next time. Mm -hmm.